Blood Bank Guy Essentials 013. Lymphocytes are white cells, right? Yes. They are. <laughs> and lymphocytes are the you know, are the enemy in graft versus host disease, right. right? So why isn't leukocyte reduction enough? Yeah, well, you know, some people think that it that it it helps actually. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Blood Bank Guy Essentials, episode 013. This is Joe Chaffin. I'm your host. I just wanted to thank you first for being here. Um, I'm on a little bit of a different schedule now with the podcast. I had initially done them once a week. Uh, Just because of stuff going on in my everyday life, I'm needing to move it to every two weeks. So again, thank you for your patience. Thank you for the feedback. I've gotten lots of great feedback and lots of wonderful comments on the Pediatric Transfusion Podcast, on the Daratumumab, I can't even say it, podcast, as well as the podcast on... uh, drug-induced immune hemolytic anemia. So check those out if you haven't seen them yet. Uh, Today is an Ask the Blood Bank Guy podcast. This is based on a question that someone sent in to me. Uh, So please do so if you have some questions. I'm going to be introducing to you today my new co-host for podcasts like this. Her name is Dr. Heidi Shaffey, and she's awesome. I think you'll love her. Um, So without any further introduction, let's get on with it and let us talk about transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. Hi, and welcome, everyone. Today, we are going to do something different on the Blood Bank Guy podcast. As I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm now going to have a co-host for the episodes where I'm doing Ask the Blood Bank Guy topics. And so I am super proud to introduce you today to my very good friend, Dr. Heidi Shaffey, who has agreed to help me with hosting duties. So Heidi, you you have to tell me, how in the world did I manage to talk you into this? Well, Joe, you didn't have to try too hard. I think I kind of approached you and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could just pick your brains for a few minutes or an hour or so every once in a while? And you thought, hmm, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, well, see, that's what happens when you volunteer. You end up, uh, you end up with co-hosting duties on a podcast. So, well, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Clearly. Well, Heidi, why don't you? Uh, we, we're actually going to have you on uh, a later podcast where you're doing the the majority of the presenting. So we'll we'll go into your your background and your bio a little bit more then. But for just for now, can you just tell everyone real quickly who you are, what you do, et cetera? Okay, so. I am actually a clinical pathologist. I did my uh, residency in clinical pathology and my transfusion medicine fellowship, both at Cedar sinai where I stayed on as faculty for a couple of years before I joined the Kaiser Permanente system as uh, both the medical director of the blood bank and a clinical pathologist. Very nice. Well, and uh, some of you out there may know that uh, I... I worked at Cedar sinai for a while, so that's where uh, Heidi and I crossed paths as she tried her best as a as a blood bank fellow to keep me from doing stupid things, which wa- she wasn't always successful, quite frankly, but, uh, but she tried to keep me on the straight mm-hmm. and narrow anyway. So thanks for that, Heidi. No problem. <laughs> Anytime. And I just do want to take a second to let our listeners know that Joe is a mentor of mine and someone that not only taught me blood banking during my fellowship, but continues to be my to go um, I mean, my to-go-to expert for all things pertaining to blood banking. So I'm quite excited about being uh, able to do this today. (laughs) Well, you're too kind, as usual. Um, Well, so, hey, uh, you're the host today, so all yours, Heidi. Take it over. Perfect. So as I mentioned, I'm very happy to be doing this interview and um, being able to pick your brains on what I think is a very interesting topic today. In the next hour or so, we're going to explore transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. Now, for many of us, when we hear graft-versus-host disease, we think of the possible negative side effects of transplantation, whether it's solid organs or stem cells. Um, So at some point during this podcast, I'm going to ask you to first start by telling us what the heck is graft-versus-host disease. (laughs) But before that... I do want to talk about an email that you received, uh, which sparked um, an interest for us to do this podcast. Sure. Um, can you kind of go through that 
with us? Yeah, you bet. Since this is a since this is an Ask the Blood Bank guy episode, it's it's only fair to disclose that this was uh, the idea to do this podcast did come from a question that uh, a listener sent to me. Um, and just as an aside, uh, we we're going to do this roughly every month. You guys out there listening, and I am uh, more than happy to to take on your questions. Just go to the go to the website bbguy.org slash ask, and you can send in your questions. Uh, I'll never disclose your name or uh, where you work or anything like that without your permission, so you don't have to worry about that. But I got this email recently, and it and it really kind of opened my eyes to something. Um, uh, let me just kind of take you through it. I'm not going to read all of it, but uh, the email started uh, that Kapalovich et al. published an article in Blood last year in 2015, which was a systemic review of reported cases of TAGVHD. And the authors write that their findings seem to challenge the traditional thinking that risk for transfusion-associated GVHD is driven by host factors, as about 50% of the cases they found would not be considered high risk by traditional guidelines. And the author of this, this email goes on to express some frustration because he is, a, uh, he is not a blood banker. He is a hematologist-oncologist, and he feels like the, the blood bankers that he is associated with don't seem terribly excited about this article and don't seem like they're kind of adapting and adjusting. And, and honestly, it's a wonderful, really fair email because he wants to know my opinion and whether or not I think things should change based on this article. So I, I, I thought first maybe today we would, we would kind of go through the generalities of graft versus host disease and transfusion-associated variety as well, and then at the end really kind of bring it back to that article because I think you need the background before you're able to really understand how this article has the potential to really shake things up. I definitely agree with you, Joe. When you sent this article to me, I thought, wow, this could really be a game changer in how we approach uh, transfusion-associated graft versus host disease. So I'm looking forward to discussing it a little later. But why don't we start with um, you telling us what graft versus host disease is? Well, that's a th- that is a, an appropriate first question. So let's let's hit that. Really, when we talk about graft versus host disease, that's kind of a big general category, Heidi. And, and you mentioned earlier that when most people think about graft versus host disease, they're thinking about the type of a type of interaction that occurs primarily after a stem cell transplant, a bone marrow umbilical cord or, or peripheral stem cell transplant, whatever, or uh, the kind that comes from passenger lymphocytes carried on in solid organs. But in addition, there's a third category, and that's from cellular blood products. But we'll, And we'll talk about that in just a second. But in general, graft-versus-host disease is simply an attack on the recipient, in other words, the person who is the recipient of the graft, whether that's an organ or a transplant uh, or a blood transfusion. Uh, It's an attack on that recipient's human leukocyte antigens, or HLA, uh, by T lymphocytes. And those T lymphocytes come from the graft, in other words, the the product or organ that goes from the donor into the recipient. So that interaction is, is a really interesting and, quite frankly, really complicated interaction. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to it, and there's a lot of details behind it. And we're not going to go into them in, in enormous detail. Quite frankly, uh, I should tell everyone, Heidi's done a lot of great research into T lymphocytes and their function. She knows 50 million times more about it than I do, so you could probably talk about it better than I could. But we'll stay I'm not a sure bit, about that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stay a little bit more on the surface with this and just, and, and just kind of talk in generalities. But, but basically what has to happen for graft-versus-host disease to occur is, is three basic things, and we've known about this for forever. I mean, I, the, the basic requirements for graft-versus-host disease were described oh, right about 50 years ago in the 1960s. Essentially, first, you, there has to be HLA differences between the graft and the host. In other words, if the, if the graft and the host are HLA identical, and we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes, then there wouldn't be any reason for one to attack the other. Uh, second, there has to be active, viable T lymphocytes in the graft. In other words, the donated product or the product that's transfused or transplanted uh, into the recipient. And then finally, uh, there has to be some sort of a problem with the host's ability to respond, either an incompetent host or some sort of inactive cellular immunity in the host that leads there not to be um, sort of a response to that attack by by the graft products. So that's that's generally what we need in order to in order to have graft versus host disease. And again, that's true regardless of what type of GVHD we're talking about. And Joe, what kind of findings do we see in GVHD in terms of like clinical signs and symptoms? 
great. That's that's a super question. And uh, realistically, again, whether whether we're talking about transfusion associated or any kind of graft versus host disease, again, we're staying in the big umbrella here first. Uh, basically, when when we think about this being an attack on HLA, so an attack on the human leukocyte antigens. And I'm going to say HLA antigens. I know I will, even though it's redundant, human leukocyte antigens, antigens, so forgive me. But it's an attack on those HLA antigens. And in order to do that, well, those T lymphocytes have to go to areas where there's lots of HLA antigens. And mm-hmm. really, we think about that in three main places, the skin, the liver, and the GI tract. And certainly, there are there are other places that have HLA antigens, but, but HLA antigens are particularly rich in the skin, the liver, and the GI tract. So you get classically a, a, a very characteristic rash. Um, it's a bright red rash. It, it has a tendency to be a combination of, of both flat and raised lesions. We call that maculopapular. Um, it usually starts on the body and expands peripherally. And, and if you look at pictures of it, of this rash, it kind of it's characteristically seen um, in terms of the diagnostic diagnostic appearance on the palms of the palms of the hands and mm-hmm. soles of the feet. Um, and a, Again, uh, clinicians that know skin and and uh, and are good with derm, which I am not, uh, would tell you that it's a fairly characteristic rash. Eventually, in a few few of these patients, it can actually progress to all the way up to bullous formation. So so actually large flaccid blisters essentially. So that's the classic characteristic, and in fact, the most common finding in graft-versus-host disease. Then you have liver injury, where the, the liver is damaged by the, by the attack of these T lymphocytes, typically manifested by uh, you know, elevated liver function tests, uh, bilirubin elevations eventually, and then finally, the GI tract, uh, among the most common things, where they just diffuse damage to the, to the gastrointestinal tract, they end up having profuse watery diarrhea, can have nausea and vomiting as well, but very, fairly characteristic. With, uh, with the, the lower GI type symptoms. And with all of this, kind of the overriding thing that, well, it's not necessarily overriding, but, but w- w- again, one of the more common thing that, things that happens is that when all these things are occurring, as you can imagine, you got a whole lot of cytokines being generated. Those cytokines include, include things that raise your temperature. So fever is really common with okay. GHD as well. Got it. And it can be quite severe, the, the symptoms that you talked about. Absolutely. And, and you know, we could, we're not really going to talk about, uh, about GVHD and with the solid organ and stem cell transplants, but there, it's kind of broken down into acute GVHD and chronic GVHD. Mostly we're going to stick with the acute GVHD. And absolutely, it can be very significant and very severe. So that's the classic GVHD. Yep. So Tell me about the transfusion associated graft versus host disease. Maybe first about the signs and symptoms, how they're different, and um, just overall, you know, what the heck is it? <laughs> well, you bet. So, so as I as I was saying before, uh, when the source of those active T lymphocytes that are that are causing this attack on the host HLA HLA antigens is a cellular blood product, really um, the the, the presentation is not enormously different initially uh, mm-hmm. b- because just like regular GVHD, you get a fever typically, uh, you get involvement of the skin, the liver, the GI tract, all those same kind of symptoms that you would get in, a, in an acute graft-versus-host disease from, uh, from a solid organ transplant or from a stem cell transplant. Same kind of deal. But with TAGVHD in particular, there is one additional finding that makes it that makes it much more significant and makes it much more dramatic. And that's that that with transfusion associated graft versus host disease, another HLA rich area that those T lymphocytes can attack is the bone marrow. That's a big, big problem. Um, you know, when you think about when you think about TAGV or just excuse me, just regular GVHD in a stem cell transplant. Well, if you think about that, so patients that are getting stem cell transplants, they, they tend to be get preparation beforehand, usually either wiping out the bone marrow or partially wiping out their, bone, their native bone marrow. Then you give them the stem cells, and even if they get GVHD, there's not a whole lot in the marrow to wipe out, and there's stem cells in the product to repopulate the marrow. But if you're talking about transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease, you can get that attack of the marrow, but uh uh-oh, the product that you gave is not rich in stem cells. So there's nothing to replenish that marrow. So the bone marrow just gets wiped out. And that's the biggest problem with TAGVHD in comparison to so-called regular GVHD. 
And this is a key point for the residents and, you know, anyone in training who's listening to this podcast. Mm-hmm. This is a very important, uh, differentiation between classical GVHD and transfusion associated graft, uh, versus host disease and something that you'll see come up in question format. And, you know, when you're on the rotations, people will ask you, well, what's the main difference, uh, clinically? And this is one of the main differences that you want to remember. Um, Joe, what about, is there a definition of, you know, like so many other things in medicine, you have to have criteria to meet a certain, uh, to be able to be diagnosed with a certain disease. Is there such a thing for transfusion associated graft versus host disease? Yeah, there is. Um, and, and actually the, we're seeing, we're seeing more and more that people in the United States, um, and in part because of the, the new AABB standard that requires you to, to try and use standard definitions for transfusion reactions, there are definitely, there is definitely a, a, a definition that is being used, and it comes from the CDC, the Centers for Di- Disease Control, and specifically the National Health and Safety Network, NHSN. Um, these definitions are published. You can do a Google search for them, and, and the downloads are I'm 98.9% sure that they're free. You can just download the the specific definitions. So according to NHSN, and again, this is the definition in the U.S. I know people listen to this from other countries, so you would need to check with your own uh, organizations. But the definitions include a couple things. First, there's a timeline. Um, Between two days and six weeks after the transfusion is completed is the timeline for THEVHD. And in order to make the diagnosis, you need two things. Well, let me rephrase. You need two categories of things. The first category is some combination of some of the things that we've talked about. And these are the the clinical findings, the the rash, fever, uh, liver dysfunction, pancytopenia, diarrhea, marrow aplasia, and and hepatomegaly, a big liver. So all those things, some combination of that that would make you think about uh, transfusion-associated graft versus host disease and in addition to some combination of those, you need to have some biopsy confirmation of a characteristic appearance histologically of THEVHD. And that characteristic appearance is seen typically most commonly in skin biopsies, but it's also seen in, in liver biopsies as well. So the, the skin biopsy, and well, it's been a long time since I've done uh, anatomic. Derm path. <laughs> yeah, derm path is, is a little bit in my rear view mirror. Uh, but the, there are some characteristic findings that you can, you can go and listen to an AP podcast to find out. <laughs> Basically, this degeneration of the epidermis, necrotic keratinocytes, and, and obviously uh, lymphocytes. Around the uh, around the superficial capillaries I, again, I not my world anymore. Um, and the liver biopsy, same thing. Some characteristic findings. If you've got both of those, some some of those clinical findings and the biopsy confirmation, that is uh, that is consistent with, and that makes the diagnosis of uh, TAGVHD. So, what about? some sort of PCR testing and chimerisms. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I find that so yeah. confusing. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it, honestly, the, the, it's, a, it's a fairly specialized test. Um, th- this is actually also included in the, the NHSN uh, definitions. And it's, it's basically how you can definitively assign this diagnosis. And the, really, the, the, the only way to, to definitively say that this is TAGVHD, even with those two, two criteria that I mentioned, is if you're able to, uh, to establish white cell chimerism. And chimerism simply means there's more than one, there's the cells of more than one person in your body, essentially. So you can do that with biopsies, you can do that with different kinds of samples, and basically you just run PCR and, and you go, whoops, there's more than one set of DNA here. Got um, it. So if you've got that, then that definitively says that this person um, has, again, in, in with the other findings, that this person has THEVHD. Now, the details of that in terms of what they're looking for on, on PCR, uh, I know that there are a lot of different, a lot of different variants that they're looking for, um, but that's a little beyond where we need to go with this podcast, I think. I agree. Um, Joe, now, I've only been practicing for three, four years, but I've never seen a case of Fortunately, I've never had to deal with a case of transfusion associated graft versus host disease. What about you? Have you uh, seen any cases and how common is it? 
Well, I have been practicing for just slightly more than three to four years. <laughs> just slightly. Just slightly. Uh, well, in in about twenty six years or so, hanging around blood banks, not all practicing, but uh, in 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 that time frame, I personally have never definitively seen one. I've seen suspected cases, but I have I have not defi- seen a definite case of TAGVHD. And and really, I, I think that that's true for a lot of people. Um, I, when we when we talk about the incidence of this mm-hmm. of this disease, truth is we don't know. Um, it, it, and there's a couple reasons for that. First is that a I don't believe it happens very often in terms of that classic presentation. Um, it, but but second, um, it's really easy to miss. In other words, if you've got someone who's already really really sick um, and they they get a transfusion that that either might down the line the line lead to TAGVHD and they expire before the symptoms before the symptoms occur, well, obviously you'd never know that. Right. But further, if you got someone who crashes, you know, ten days after a transfusion, but they're already super sick from other stuff, it can be really hard to separate that out. So it requires a lot of uh, a very high index of suspicion to make the diagnosis. There's no question that it is underdiagnosed. I mean, no, no question about that. Um, what we can say is that uh, in, according to the, in the United States, all transfusion-related fatalities are required to be reported to FDA. And I, I actually just went and looked at this before, before I jumped on the, uh, the recording today, Heidi. And uh, since 2005, uh, there have been only three cases reported, three fatalities from transfusion-associated graft versus host disease reported to FDA. Okay. Uh, so between, between 2005 and the most recent data, which is fiscal year 2014, but that's just fatalities. That is fatalities. Okay. But as we'll talk about shortly, realistically, most of the cases are fatalities because mm-hmm. people don't do very well with it. Um, so not not a ton of cases reported in the U.S. Um, the study that we'll talk about later actually broke down the number of cases um, that they were able to find in the in the literature. Um, they broke them down by particular time frames, and and what they show is that uh, in the literature since the year two thousand, yeah, since the year two thousand, there's been a total of sixty six cases all around the world reported in the literature. So again, not a ton of cases reported. Um, But uh, again, we also know that there's no question that it is underreported significantly. Got it. So I want to now change directions a little bit and ask you about the mechanism of transfusion associated graft versus host disease. And, um, you know, ask you to simplify it for us so we can really understand what's going on on the cellular level. Okay. Let me give that a shot. Um, this is uh, quite honestly one of my, it's one of my favorite illustrations, I think because it, it displays my, my incredible level of immaturity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not rolling my eyes or anything. Oh, no, not you. You you had to listen to me for a couple of years, so uh, so I know you would never roll your eyes. <laughs> anyway, so how does it happen? Well, it, let's let's make this as simple as possible. And um, normally, this is something that I show, I put up on a screen. So I'm going to have to paint word pictures here for our our listening audience. So let me see what I can do. Let's just imagine that we have a that we have two people. One is a donor and one is a recipient. And let's just assume that they are not identical twins. So there is some level of difference in their HLA types. One one person has one type, the reci- the donor has one type, the recipient has another type. Mm-hmm. So it's really important to understand the normal situation. In other words, what normally happens when this particular patient's transfusion goes into this particular recipient. Now again, this is normal. Under normal circumstances, the, the transfused, a transfused cellular blood product that contains viable active T lymphocytes is transfused into the recipient, and, and the white cells that are in that product take a look around, and they do exactly what you would expect a white cell to do. In other words, they look around and they analyze, what's the HLA type of all these tissues that, are, that I'm seeing in this person's body? And they would say, as you would expect, eh, it's not me. And Mm -hmm. and so as a result, those transfused cells would try to proliferate and would try to mount an immune response of some sort against that host's tissues. Now, again, that's normal. That's exactly what you would expect a T lymphocyte to do. It looks around, finds something that's not it, not it's not its own 
HLA type and tries to mount a response against it. And when I show this, I, I, I illustrate that most incredibly uh, immaturely with, with little Pac-Men, you know, those little waka waka mm-hmm. waka guys. And so right. they're, they're going, they're trying to attack onto those host tissues. But again, under normal circumstances, the host being a normal immunocompetent happy person has a really big, bad immune system, a a great immune system that is capable of looking at those actual transfused white cells and saying, hey, you know what? You don't belong here. This is not your area. This is not your body. Get out and basically mounting a counterattack. So that's the way I describe it. It's an attack first by the transfused cells, then a counterattack by the host's immune system to get rid of those cells. Again, that's normal. We see that. We see that white cells actually hang around in someone's body after a transfusion for a few days. That's not mm-hmm. uncommon at all, and that's normal. So, again, that's, that's what we would expect to happen under normal circumstances. Now, in TAGVHD, though, something gets thrown into the works. And, and I, I tend to illustrate this because, as you know, Heidi, I spent a long time in the military and, and it made a, a big impression on me. So let's, let's talk about this in military terms, okay? So okay. under three different scenarios, we might have a problem with that normal attack counterattack sequence. Okay, so first, what if the host doesn't have enough soldiers? In other words, the troops are depleted. The patient is leukopenic. If there's not enough soldiers to fight off that counterattack, or sorry, to fight, fight off that initial attack, we may have a problem. Okay, that's, mm-hmm. that's situation one. Situation two is what if the soldiers are under orders not to counterattack? In other words, the patient is immunosuppressed, either from a pharmacologic reason or from some other reason, whether that's a cellular, a built-in inherited cellular immunity or whatever. You may have plenty of soldiers, but the soldiers are, they're not allowed to attack uh, those, uh, those, in, those invading cells. Again, that's a potential problem. The okay. third the third scenario is the one that people miss, is the one that people forget about. And that's that the enemy is camouflaged. Okay, and, and we need to go into this in pretty significant detail to, to make sure people understand this. Um, so when the enemy is camouflaged, what that means most commonly is that the invading cells, in other words, those transfused cells, are typically homozygous for a particular HLA haplotype. Now, that's a lot of words. So those of you that, that if that's Greek to you, <laughs> let's, let's talk about that for a second. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, let, I'm going to tell you the HLA type uh, of um, the genotype, I should say, uh, for the, in the HLA locus for the, for the attacking cells and the recipient cells. And again, hang with me here. P- paint the word picture in your head. Okay, let's imagine that the, uh, that the transfused cells... Um, carry two different genes for HLA antigens. That's true for everyone. And one allele, one of those copies, has, the, has a, uh, a genotype of HLA A1B2. Now, don't write me. I, I, I know. I'm, I'm making this simple. I'm, I'm just imagining, okay? A1B2. And the other chromosome has the same allele. In other words, they're homozygous for HLA A1B2. Again, I know that's not accurate, but we're, we're being simple here. Now that, so he's got two copies of the same allele. If that is transfused to someone who has their HLA type being on one chromosome, A1B2, just the same as the two copies that that transfused person has, but the other chromosome has A3B4, suddenly we may have a potential problem. Because what, what I mean by that is that those transfused cells that are A1B2, A1B2, go into the body and they look at the body and the, the recipient and they see that A3B4 that's on the second chromosome and they say, oop, not me, I'm going to attack. But the reverse is not true because that recipient who has A1B2 on one chromosome would recognize the, that homozygous person as being okay. So in other words, we'd have an attack, but we would not have a counterattack. And that's, that's the potential problem when the enemy is camouflaged. We call that the one-way HLA match. Um, and I'm going to, by the way, just so everyone knows, uh, I'm going to put up 
some slides on the, the show page for, for this episode. So you can kind of see that more graphically, um, and, and it'll, it'll make more sense to you. So again, just as, just, to, I've, I've talked for a long time. I'll shut up in just a second, Heidi. So the three scenarios, not enough soldiers. So no counter, not enough soldiers to counterattack. The mm-hmm. soldiers are deactivated or the person is immunosuppressed. And then finally, the enemy is camouflaged, that one way HLA match with a, with an HLA homozygous donor and an HLA heterozygous recipient. Any of those, if you have any of those, you get an attack, but no counterattack. And those transfused T lymphocytes just start going crazy. So, Joe, what's the main, like, walk, walk away, you know, take home message from this? Homozygous donor, homozygous heteros- donor, heterozygous, heterozygous, heterozygous recipient, yep. and the other three points that you talked about. I mean, well, the other two points, not mm-hmm. enough soldiers and soldiers are deactivated. Okay. Right. And what about, um, does it with all products, like anything that comes out of the blood bank um, could cause this? Yeah, n- not quite. Um, I mean, I think that I think that what we've focused on historically, and for good reason, is the the so-called cellular blood products. And it's not really an accurate term to say cellular blood products. We 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 think of cellular blood products as white uh, of whole blood, I should say, red cells, platelets, and granulocytes primarily. And we don't think of of the plasma products like frozen plasma and cryoprecipitate as being quote unquote cellular products. The truth is there are plenty of cells in there. It's just that the cells are deactivated by the freezing thawing process in, in the frozen plasma and the cryo. So um, generally speaking, the, the, the products associated with TAGVHD are, um, as I said, whole blood, though we don't transfuse it very often anymore, red cells, platelets, and granulocytes. Okay. So just to summarize, so far we've learned that it Transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease can be, um, it's rare, possibly underreported, but mm-hmm. overall rare. When it does happen, um, it can be quite devastating yep. since it can wipe out the marrow. Mm-hmm. And as you alluded earlier, it could cause fatalities. Yep. It could be quite um, terrible for the patient. Absolutely. So knowing that it can be such an aggressive disease, mm-hmm. who should we, you know, protect from it? Who's at risk? Yeah, that's, you know, we've spent a lot of time in the past working on that and trying to figure out um, who are the people are who are at risk. And I, I think you can kind of break it down into three main Areas with a couple of others that are that are kind of a little bit more borderline and, and not quite not quite as clear. So let, let's just give you the, the the main areas for the what I would call the traditionally thought at risk groups. And the first of those is babies, the mm-hmm. second of those is cancer patients, and mm-hmm. the third of those is people that are getting HLA similar products. In other words, that that the risk of that one way HLA match that I talked about before. So we can go Got over it. each of those. Let's, um, you want to start, start with, with babies? the babies? Let's start with the babies. Yeah. yeah the babies. So in terms of babies, uh, really the first cases that we knew were, were TAGBHD came in babies with inherited cellular immune defects. And there's a whole bunch of them. And there's again, a lot of details behind it that I, that I either don't know or don't want to take the time to go into, but, but severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome or SCIDS, as people call it, Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, DeGeorge syndrome, things like that that are inherited cellular immune defects. And that's, it's really pretty simple to understand why that would be a problem. There's no counterattack, right? The, the baby can't counterattack the viable T lymphocytes that come in. So, so that's right. pretty clear. It's an, there's right. no immune system or it's an immature immune system. Yep, you bet. Absolutely right. And, and for similar reasons, premature babies... Most people think um, that their that their cellular immunity is not adequately developed them, for them to fight off uh, the the attack of the viable T lymphocytes. So most people will say premature babies are at risk. Clearly, we know that babies who get intrauterine transfusion um, that's been 
pretty clearly shown that those that those babies are at risk for a TAGVHD. And I'm not really sure why the intrauterine part makes such a big difference. Um, hmm. uh, I'm sure uh, my last week's guest, Dr. Cassandra Josephson, would be able to tell me in great <laughs> detail. But uh, but the reality is that we know that that's true. And the other thing that we know is a really big risk factor is well, two things that go with full ter- primarily full term babies, but really babies of of any age, and that's exchange transfusion and especially ECMO. ECMO does seem to be mm-hmm. a big deal. And um, Heidi, tell, tell everybody what ECMO is because you're, you're closer to that than me. It's extracorporeal membranous oxygenation. Yay. So this is basically when you try to um, bypass the, um, you know, the heart and lung but mm-hmm. still get the blood oxygenated through this extracorporeal circuit. Yep. See, I, I'm, I'm not even your teacher anymore, and I still throw quiz questions at you. <laughs> right, I know. I was like, wait a minute. I'm asking questions <laughs> of you. I'm the interviewer here. You're right. I, I apologize. <laughs> I, that was out of line. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So the, then the last thing for babies, the last thing for babies is the directed products. And, and that, that kind of goes with um, – because directed products are primarily – or most commonly from family members. And we'll talk about that more with the HLA similar product part. So babies, babies are a big deal. We spend a lot of time worrying, sometimes maybe unnecessarily, because there are some borderline indications in there. Uh, but, but clearly, we need to think about irradiation when it comes to pediatric transfusion. So um, can I ask you like a practical question? Sure. So you're in, uh, working at a hospital-based transfusion service, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you have a NICU, uh, you have a pretty busy labor and delivery uh, service. Mm-hmm. Should, would you recommend having uh, in your policies and procedures irradiation for all neonates? Yeah, that's a, that's a superb question because real, realistically, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, part of the problem with irradiated products is that when we leave the the trigger for uh, knowing when to order irradiated products completely on the on the clinician's plate, um, it can get missed sometimes. And, right. And quite honestly, uh, I think we in blood banks sometimes have a tendency to to I don't know I don't know if pompous is the right word, but we we just have a tendency to kind of sit there with our arms crossed and say, well, they didn't order it by God, so we're not going to. I mean, and, and realistically, that's not. I don't think that's the right approach. I mean, you and I both practiced in a place that took that to, to a, a quite a bit farther extreme than, than most places at, at Cedar sinai They basically irradiate all cellular products for all patients. Um, and, and I will admit that, that there was a time that, that I thought that our mutual friend, Dr. Clapper, m- maybe was going too far with that. But I understand the sentiment. And, and you know, for that reason, I think it's better, it's probably better, my opinion, to over-irradiate, especially in the neonatal the neonatal population that it is to under irradiate with one very important exception. And I, I, I think this is something, this is a real take home for everybody that babies are extraordinarily sensitive to high levels of potassium. Mm -hmm. And when we irradiate red cells and leave them sitting around, there is a substantial and significant uh, increase in the, in the potassium that's released into the product. And as a result of that, I, with that exception, I, if you're if you're talking about freshly irradiated products for all babies, I can mm-hmm. live with that, and I think that's a reasonable, practical strategy. So we'll talk about irradiation a little bit later on because I do want to ask you some questions about it. But for now, let's get back to the at-risk groups. Okay, you bet. So so the next group um, after the babies is the cancer patients. And uh, when we talk about cancer patients being at risk for, for TAGVHD, there's the you can really think of it two ways. In some cases, people are probably at risk for TAGVHD from uh, just from their disease. Just the cancer itself can be the problem. In in more cases, though, it's the treatment for the cancer that causes the problem and causes them to be at risk for TAGVHD. And in some cases, it can be a combination of both. So. So when we think about cancer patients and TAGVHD, virtually everyone thinks first about hematologic malignancies. So, so blood cancers, uh, things like Hodgkin's disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, acute myelogen- myelogenous leukemia, et cetera. All those hematologic cancers, those blood cancers that we think about. Now, Hodgkin's, for example, is one that's really interesting. Because um, with Hodgkin's in particular, there does seem to be some sort of an incre- r- increased risk for TAGVHD 
that's just a consequence of having Hodgkin's. Hmm. It's kind of weird and, and strange, and I don't, I don't really know the mechanisms behind it. Uh, but Hodgkin's has really been, been shown or is thought to be uh, an, a, a risk in and of itself. With most of the other uh, malignancies, the risk comes from the treatment. You're blasting them with chemotherapy, and you're just destroying their, uh, their own T lymphocytes that are, that are the counterattacking agents. And so they have trouble fighting off uh, the attack of the transfused cells. So hematologic malignancies are a little bit complex. Remember the association with Hodgkin's, everyone. Uh, but for most other things, it's, the, it's more a consequence of the, of the treatment. And with solid tumors, really solid tumors, uh, when you think about uh, things like breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer in adults, really probably not in and of themselves any significant risk and probably not hugely with the chemotherapy as well. Though, again, you'll sometimes see people irradiate for those patients. But when we think about it, there there are definitely somewhat older reports in pediatric uh, patients with neuroblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma and things like that 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 may or may not have been purely related to the tumor. Um, I think people... Opposed to the treatment. Exactly. I think that people still think of those, at least to some extent, as an inherent risk just from the tumor itself. Um, So most people will irradiate blood for pediatric patients with neuroblastoma, glioblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, things like that, regardless of of how much they're getting treated with chemo. Um, We also think about, for cancer patients, um, stem cell transplants. uh, And and realistically, we we all know that stem cell transplants don't just happen in cancer patients. There are certainly non-malignant indications, but the majority of people that get stem cell transplants um, are cancer patients. Well, I mean, that's just like a perfect setup for THGVHD, right? Because right. they get prepared, they get the heavy duty chemo radiation therapy, and their bone marrows get wiped out. They're incredibly leukopenic. They're incredibly immunosuppressed. So, yeah, clearly there's there that's a, a very clear cut indication for those patients receiving irradiated products. And there's there's one other one other category in cancer patients that I just wanted to mention. I, and I talked about you know the chemotherapy stuff, but there's a couple of different chemotherapeutic agents in particular, that are, uh, that are pretty clearly associated kind of on their own with TAGVHD. Most of those are related to um, treatment for these. Well, they are related to, to treatment for these diseases. One of those is fludarabine. Fludarabine is a purine analog. Basically, it's a, it, it mimics a, a regular part of, of DNA and inhibits the, the, the DNA synthesis uh, of the tumor primarily. It's used for, for CLL, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia in particular. Um, and there are other, there are other uh, forms of purine analogs as well, different drugs like cladribine, pentastatin, things like that. Mm-hmm. But fludarabine is most famous. It by itself causes enough profound immunosuppression in the recipient to put the patient at serious risk of TAGVHD. Um, and one other one that I, forgive me for interrupting, Heidi, one other one that I, um, that I was just made aware of recently, though it's been around for a while, and I don't know why I missed it. There's a, a drug called alimtuzumab, um, which is basically anti-CD, anti-CD52. Um, it's used in B-cell CLL, um, and as well as relapsing multiple sclerosis. Um, and basically, it, it also causes substantial immunosuppression. And, and the package insert actually says that they, these patients should only get irradiated blood products to avoid TAGVHD. I wonder if um, clinicians are aware of this. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm I not hope sure. they are. I would hope they would be there's, too. Yeah. Honestly, it's not something I've come across very often, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I'd never heard of it until you just mentioned it right now. <laughs> See, we both learned something today. That's awesome. Yes, I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead, Heidi. Third category. Third category, and, and that's the one that's, uh, that we traditionally have kind of tagged onto the end and gone, oh, yeah, there's that stuff as well. Um, mm-hmm. But as we'll talk about later, this may be a bigger deal than we thought. And that's the patients that are immunocompetent but getting HLA-similar products. And that goes back to that one-way HLA match that I talked about before. Patients who are getting products that are close enough to them, in other words, HLA homozygous donor, 
going to an HLA heterozygous recipient um, so that there's an attack, but no recognition of foreignness from the, re from the recipient, so no counterattack. And that happens primarily in, uh, well, there's a couple of places, three main places we think about it. First is directed donations, and, and again, that's primarily because most directed donations come from family members. That's just the reality. Um, you know, we, we want to, we see someone in our family that's really sick, we want to give them blood and, and help them out. And, you know, they're, in families, just statistically speaking, there's a much higher likelihood of there being that uh, HLA interaction that I was mentioning. Second is HLA matched products. Um, and that one may seem counterintuitive to people uh, unless you understand that when blood centers talk about HLA matching, they really mean let's get as close as we can get. And so sometimes you'll have a product that's really close to the donor or to the patient, but it's not exactly the patient. And so you can have that interaction that I mentioned before. And then, the homozygous yeah. donor heterozygous recipient. You got it. You got it. And then the last one is that that same interaction in a society that happens to be HLA limited. And what I mean by that, um, well, actually, I can just give you an, an example of that. In, in certain countries, Japan is the best example that we know of, just because of the somewhat limited HLA diversity in that population, if you get a transfusion in Japan, the risk is somewhere in the range of one in a thousand or so that that, that one-way HLA match will occur, just with a random off-the-shelf transfusion. That's, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's a pretty high risk. You can compare that to the United States, and the numbers vary in the United States, but it's generally somewhere around one in 20,000 to a 40,000 risk in, in the U.S. So substantially more likely in Japan. And quite honestly, that's one of the reasons that the, uh, that the number one place where TAGVHD occurs is in Japan historically. Um, but they've taken, in, they've, they've taken steps to prevent that now that we'll talk about shortly. And Joe, you had mentioned that there are also a couple of other categories that, mm, you know, it's, there's some research or some studies have shown that may benefit or are, I mean, may be at risk. Yeah. That, you know, a couple of others, um, one of which is, is probably not the case and that's cardiac surgery patients. Uh, I think most of the thought with cardiac surgery patients is that, um, that the, probably the first reported cases that we really knew of before we really knew what it was uh, of THGVHD was it was something that was called postoperative erythroderma. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, it was a milder form of THGVHD, and it was in Japan, and it was because of that interaction that I was just describing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and realistically, now, aside from that, uh, when we're when we're talking about transfusions of in cardiac surgery patients in the U.S. and other countries that don't have that risk, probably not a, a huge risk. But you'll still see that sometimes in the literature that that because of that old historical risk in cardiac surgery patients, people will talk about that. Eh, I, I think that's probably it's probably not a real thing anymore. Um, okay. And the and the last one is aplastic anemia patients. Um, and there's debate back and forth about this. A lot of times, a lot of times, patients that are that have aplastic anemia are transplant candidates, and so, for obvious reasons, they're they're, they're going to uh, just as a transplant candidate, they would be at risk. But more importantly, Got one it. of the treatments is anti-thymocyte globulin, which severely immunocompromises them even further, and so again, they they would probably be at risk as well. Okay. So, you know, you've mentioned, I mean, we've been talking about how this is an immune mediated process. Mm -hmm. It's the immune system of the recipient that's not able to do the counterattack. Mm -hmm. um, so what about AIDS patients? Are they at risk? Yeah, that's, you know, um, I, up until not too long ago, when I actually finally found an article, I always said that there had not been a reported case of uh, TAGVHD, TAGVHD in an AIDS patient, but there actually is one now. It was in a it was in a child, um, a childhood AIDS patient. But realistically, the likelihood of an of an AIDS patient getting TAGVHD seems to be very small. And there's there's a lot of detail behind that. There's competing theories as to why. One theory is that it appears that the CD8 uh, T lymphocytes are 
the, are protective from, from THEVHD, and obviously in patients with AIDS, CD8 function and number are, is preserved much longer than CD4 function. So that may be the issue, or there may be some other just imbalance in their system uh, because there's a lot more to THEVHD than those Pac-Men and soldiers that I described at the beginning. Um, something in terms of the cytokine mix may be thrown off, but realistically, most, pa- mo- pe- most people will tell you that AIDS patients are not at significant risk for THEVHD. However, I will tell you the truth. Anytime somebody asks, I, I'm, I will give them irradiated products for an AIDS patient. That's, I, I'd rather not report the next case, put it that way. Okay. And then you talked about stem cell transplant mm-hmm. patients. Uh, what about solid organ? Oh, great question. Yeah, the, with solid organs, uh, again, there, there doesn't seem to be a great risk of TAGVHD. There, there are some reported cases, I will freely admit to you. But the problem is, how do you separate out where those, where those T lymphocytes came from? Did they come from the organ? Did they come from the transfusion? Most mm-hmm. GVHD in solid organ transplant patients are come from passenger lymphocytes in the organ. Just like the classical GVHD. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Though again, I, honestly, when transplant surgeons ask for irradiated blood, I just, I give it to them. I don't want to have that fight. I, I, I don't think it's worth it because I, I think that the, I think the data is still a little bit unclear on that. And so just, you know, I, again, we kind of talked about this a little earlier about how to handle the babies. So would you say if some, like a surgeon or if a provider asks for a irradiated product and if your facility is able to somewhat easily provide it, Mm -hmm. we should provide it? Yeah. I, I, that's really how I feel. I mean, I, I, um, again, I, I, I think that the consequences of irradiating blood, Um, or over irradiating blood. Let me be clear. Irradiating blood when there may not be a solid indication to do so. I think the consequences are small provided you're not keeping it on the shelf for long periods of time before you transfuse it. Um, So I have a a very strong belief and tendency in practice to, if they ask for it, I'm generally going to give it to them. I feel the same way feel the same way. And okay, we've talked about, we've touched on this before, but can you tell me about the prognosis and of a transfusion associated graft versus disease and also if there's, you know, any treatments for it? That's the problem with this, Heidi. It's, is that the, uh, unfortunately, uh, TAGVHD, once the diagnosis is made, it's pretty much a death sentence. And, and that's, you know, you'll find you'll find articles that talk about the the, the fatality uh, rate, and, and they'll pretty much all say at least ninety percent. Um, and and w- when we talk about this article at the end, the, the, that that's pretty much the number that they came down to ninety plus percent. So I think it's a reasonable number. So the vast in the vast majority of cases, there's really nothing you can do. You can you can nail them with heavy duty immunosuppressives. I mean, things obviously starting with steroids. People do that. That usually doesn't touch it. IV immunoglobulin, uh, azathioprine, cyclosporin, antithymocyte globulin, you name it. Bring out the big guns and hit them with it. It just usually doesn't work. And and the problem is that it's that marrow that's the issue. They, the marrow is, is wiped out, and not only is it wiped out, it tends to go fibrotic. Um, and usually you, there's just no coming back from that. And these patients will, these patients will die either a, a, a hemorrhagic death or an infectious death, typically in the span of three to four weeks after diagnosis. That's the, the fairly predictable pathway. Um, Joe, so these lymphocytes that come with the donor product, mm-hmm. um, they replicate inside the recipient? Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. they replicate in a big way. They they actually, I mean, the word that the word the, the buzzword that people use for for transplant is is engraft, and that's exactly mm-hmm. what those cells do. They engraft. They become part of the part of that recipient and and go crazy and just multiply and multiply and multiply and take over the system. So when if if someone were to transplant, mm-hmm. what kind of HLA match do we do? Do we do I always say, I really, I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm not trying, you know, no, it's a great I just, question. I, I mean, yeah, what, I think, who do we match for? Do we match yeah. for the lymph donor lymphocytes that have engrafted yeah. or do we match for the native marrow? I think you would match for the native marrow though. I don't know that there's a ton of data on that, Heidi. I mean, I think okay. that people have, people have done stem cell transplant and I think early stem cell transplant may be the only thing that saves someone with TAGVHD. Um, that's that, 
in the data that's out there now, it does seem like that may be the only the only salvation. Um, but I, and I, I have not seen in the literature whether or not who you match for. But I think that I think that for me, it would be most reasonable to match for the the, the native um, HLA type. Okay. Okay. So we've thrown around the word irradiation mm-hmm. quite a few times. Yeah. Um, so. Why are we talking about irradiation? <laughs> That's a great question. So, yeah. yeah. Why are we talking? Well, we're talking about irradiation because realistically, irradiation is one of. Uh, I used to say the on- it is the only way to prevent TAGVHD, but now there there's a little bit more information, and we'll talk about that shortly. But it is the main way that we use to prevent TAGVHD. So um, irradiation it it works simply because of the fact. That, remember what we're talking about is let's go back to the military illustration or the Pac-Man illustration. We've got soldiers that are in the bag. They're active. They're T lymphocytes that are ready to go in there and waka 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 just attack those those host HLA. T- uh, foreign mm-hmm. HLA tissues, we need something to stop them. And what we have found is that irradiation, um, in particular doses, deactivates those those T lymphocytes without substantially harming, eh, without substantially harming the rest of the the rest of the product. Um, we, we typically will use a, a dosage to the center of the bag that's in the United States. The center of the bag dosage is 2,500 centigray or 25 gray, um, just a measure of, of irradiation. And, and in, again, in the U.S., we make sure that the whole bag gets at least 1,500 centigray or 15 gray. So you, you, gotta, you have to dose the product adequately to mm-hmm. deactivate those T lymphocytes. It basically stops the T lymphocytes from replicating, which mm-hmm. is, again, the problem. So there's some downsides to irradiation. Yeah, it, it's uh, I, we've kind of alluded to it. The yeah. the fact that irradiation um, does it damages the red cell membrane. There's no question about that. That's very very clear. Um, and as a result of that, you're going to get several things accumulating in a red cell product, like free hemoglobin. You know, as, mm-hmm. as, uh, you're going to get leakage from the membrane, and perhaps more importantly, because free hemoglobin, okay, I mean, it's uh, you'd rather not have it. Is it destructive to most healthy people or reasonably healthy people with adequate renal function? Not a huge deal, but potassium is a bigger deal. Um, it's basically as when the membrane gets hit with with this level of irradiation, you damage the sodium potassium pumps. So that gradient that you normally have, keeping potassium inside the cell and pumping sodium outside the cell, kind of goes away. And suddenly you get you have roughly triple the quantities of extracellular potassium, and that stays triple for basically the life of the product. So as the longer it's stored, the more potassium is going to accumulate. And really, uh, in the short term, not a huge deal, again, and especially for people with normal renal function. But for a product that's stored for a, a red cell product stored for a long period of time, that can be a lot of potassium. Okay. Um, and I know you go through this um, in your other lectures, but what does irradiation do to that? shelf life of the blood products. Oh yeah. Great, great boards question. So those of you studying for exams, you got to know this in, in the United States, the, the, uh, any product has, uh, the product has a maximum 28 day shelf life from the time that you irradiate it. 28 day shelf life from the time of irradiation. So, uh, in, in the United States, most red cells have a, a shelf life of 42 days. So at the moment that you irradiate that product, the, pro- the, the, sh- the expiration date becomes that day plus 28, or it, it would expire at the normal time, whichever comes first. So in other words, if you irradiate at day 28, for example, um, it, it, so it's 28 days from the time that the product was collected, then you don't get an extra 28 days beyond the 42. It will expire at the normal day 42. But if you irradiate on day three of shelf life, then it's going to expire at day three plus 28, which would be day 31. In the UK, they use a little different number. I believe it's 14 days maximum shelf life. And I think that's primarily for potassium issues. In in the United States, though, it's 28 days. Okay. And so, Joe, you mentioned that it, transfusion-associated GVHD mm-hmm. is caused by cellular products. Right. And you kind of talked about how you know some of the other products, it's not that they're not cellular, it's just that the cells don't really survive mm-hmm. the production process. So what products should we irradiate? 
Well, so so any of those any of those cellular products, the uh, for patients in particular for patients at risk, and again, this is what we've thought traditionally um, for those immunosuppressed patients, etc., the babies, all that. Um, you would irradiate whole blood products. You would irradiate red cell products. You would irradiate platelet products. And then the one that everybody forgets is mm-hmm. the granulocyte concentrate. Um, right, and I did a blog post on this last week with complete with some really cool pictures by the way, so i 'm not going to beat this to death but but please don 't forget everybody needs to remember this that granulocytes must it 's not just a good idea it's it 's essential that granulocytes are irradiated and, and it 's key to remember that the these are always going to immunocompromised recipients always by definition. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're an incredibly fresh product full of really active and hyper T lymphocytes that are more than ready to go in and do some damage. Um, so the, uh, don't get worried about irradiation damaging the granulocyte function. That's the thing that people get hung up on. It's not enough. Granulocytes are much more, uh, granulocytes are tougher than T lymphocytes. So in other words, the dose that deactivates the T lymphocytes doesn't really touch the granulocytes. Okay. So now... Lymphocytes are white cells, right? Yes. They are. <laughs> and lymphocytes are the you know, are the enemy in graft versus host disease, right? right? right. So why isn't leukocyte reduction enough? Uh, yeah, well, you know, some people think that it that it it helps actually. Um I, I mean so leukocyte reduction, the process of getting rid of the vast majority of the of the white cells uh, in a product, generally through filtration, but also through um inline processes for apheresis collections. Um it removes a ton of white cells. Currently with the four log filters, we're talking ninety nine point nine nine plus percent of the white cells are removed. And you might think, and it might kind of make sense to you, that if you're getting rid of that many white cells, that you you could get rid of the risk of TAGVHD. But the problem is that, um, well, we don't know the minimum dose of white cells that it takes to to create that attack and that proliferation. And there are clearly scenarios where uh, uh, leukocyte-reduced products have caused TAGVHD. We know that for a fact. Now, some of it is... Older, uh, older reports and bedside leukocyte reduction, which we know doesn't work that well. And, and quite frankly, if we're being completely honest here, we would say just by looking at the data from the United Kingdom um, in their serious hazard, hazards of transfusion or the shot data, they started leukocyte reducing right around everything right around the turn of the century, around the, uh, right around 99, 2000 in that ballpark. Um, and if you look at their reports of TAGVHD, they've just dropped off the cliff. There are really hardly any cases of TAGVHD reported in the UK. Now, granted, it's rare everywhere. And mm-hmm. you know, in the United States, we've only had a few since then as well. But how much has leukocyte reduction contributed? It's hard to tell. But it may be that leukocyte reduction, by decreasing the load of transfused white cells, it may decrease the severity. And it may make it so that, that it, there's if there is, if it's possible to have a less severe form of TAGVHD, that that might be the case. It's clear that more that of those few patients that survive, more mm-hmm. of them received leukocyte reduced products than non leukocyte reduced products. So there may be some truth to it. But again, no, I don't think anyone really believes that it is enough by itself. Okay, but it can help. It, it seems like it can help. It may. Yes, it may help. It does. Um, what about pathogen reduction? Does that help? Yeah, that's the, that's the wave of the future, pathogen reduction. And, um, you know, in the U.S., we've been behind the, the rest of the developed world in, in terms of implementing pathogen reduction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I could go into this in greater detail, but we're, we've gone for a while. So I, I think I'd like to just, just leave it at the fact that pathogen reduction is a, it, there are several different forms of technology. Basically, both of them involve treating a product after collection with an agent that will bind to the nucleic acid of any cell, any cell in there, and then you hit it with ultraviolet irradiation, and it cross-links the DNA. So it's primarily, obviously, for organisms, but it also deactivates the white cells in that product. Mm-hmm. So. Either way, um, it deactivates those T lymphocytes as well as the pathogens, and it seems like pathogen reduction, once it is fully implemented in the U.S., which is going to be a while, it's, it's approved for with one technology for platelets right now, um, but once it's eventually, I think, approved, then irradiation may become 
a little less important? Well, in fact, a lot less important because the pathogen reduction seems to work as well as irradiation in deactivating those T lymphocytes. Okay. So now I like to start um, concluding our talk by going back to what we talked about at the very beginning, which was the email you received. Yes. It's taken me a while so, to get back to that, Heidi, hasn't it? I know, <laughs> but I am glad. I think this has been very, very helpful and extremely educational. So um, can you summarize what's the latest and the greatest in literature for yeah. us? You know, this, this article is really, uh, you said it, it's, it has potential to be a game changer. The, the reference will be on the show page, but basically if you're listening to this in your car, it's in, it came out in the journal Blood in July 2015. I think it was mid-July, July 16, I think, of 2015. Um, it's an article from a group uh, primarily in Canada, but also in Australia and, and Boston, Massachusetts. But they essentially decided that they were going to analyze every single published case of TAGVHD in the literature. And this was a big job. They went through a ton of different cases. They eliminated a bunch for various reasons. Um, uh, Again, you can read the article to to see why. But they they ended up analyzing uh, 384 unique cases. Uh, And there were definitely some surprises in there. You want me to talk about the surprises, Heidi? I do actually. I, I, I will talk about the surprises. <laughs> I'm all like definitely about the surprises. the surprises. So you know the the, the article is really good. It's a good reference to keep because it kind of goes over the mechanisms of things that we've thought historically. But the first big surprise to me was that only about half, about forty eight point nine percent, well exactly forty eight nine percent of the cases that they saw of the patients with TAGVHD had clinical histories with classic indications for irradiation. Now think about that for a second. When we went over the, the classic indications, the, the at-risk patients, we talked about the babies, we talked about the cancer patients, um, things like that, the, only about half of them had clinical histories like that. And all the other ones were just relatively random transfusions. And that, that kind of makes me go, whoa, hang on a second. That's a little, that's a little scary. And we'll talk more about that in just a sec. Um, the other thing that was surprising is that they found no cases of reported TAGVHD in products that were older than 14 days at the time of transfusion. So in other words, if a, uh, if a product was not a fresh product anymore, if it was over 14 days old, uh, there's no reported case in the literature that they could find anyway uh, the, of that product causing TAGVHD. Now, do you think this is because the lymphocytes just die out? I think that's uh, exactly why. I th- okay. and, and I think everyone's pretty aware of that. That's been, that's been shown is that after roughly 10-ish days, uh, mm-hmm. the lymphocytes just kind of degenerate and they're not really very active anymore. So, so that's almost certainly the reason, but I don't think anyone had actually shown that before. We had thought before that fresh products are more likely to cause it, but it was interesting to see of all the cases reported, no one found anything older than 14 days. Okay. Um, the, what else? The other thing that was that was interesting to me and surprising is that there was a significant overrepresentation of those one-way HLA match cases, and that's that's really that's kind of a it's an interesting thought that that they saw a heck of a lot. Well, to be fair, not every case had HLA typing, so they don't know out of those mm-hmm. 384 cases, they don't know the HLA types for all of them. But the, of the ones where the HLA types were reported, there was a, a really super high proportion of them that were in immunocompetent recipients who got a one-way HLA-matched product, uh, either knowingly or in most cases unknowingly. And that's that's interesting to me because that suggests, as I said before, that, um, you know, in, we always have thought about this in populations like Japan where you know, there's HLA limitations and there's a much higher risk of getting that one-way HLA match, that it may be a bigger deal than we thought, that there may be some, over, there's definitely over-representation in the group that they found. The one other thing, and, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. the one other thing no, 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 go ahead. that they mentioned, I don't know if it's terribly surprising that there was very little, in fact, I shouldn't have put, the, I shouldn't have called this a surprise actually, but it's, there was very little TAGVHD in products that were previously irradiated. And the ones that were probably had technical issues. So that actually is not a surprise. That's a good thing. Um, but the, the problem was is that the majority of the, the cases that they found were from people that were, or at least half were from people that you wouldn't normally have irradiated. And they were, then the products were non-irradiated. Okay. And Joe, 
they found the products causing transfusion associated graft versus host disease as, you know, the typical ones that we worry about, the cellular products, or were there any surprises there? Not huge. I mean, there was one reported case, as I recall, from liquid plasma, um, the, the never frozen variety. Uh, mm-hmm. but other than that, it, it's exactly the products that you would expect. Um, and, and I will tell you that the, since the majority of the cases that they found were from, uh, were from the decades prior to the year 2000, I mentioned before that they only found 66 cases since the year 2000, mm-hmm. between 90 and 99, there were almost 200 cases. So, so it does seem to be decreasing and that may go along with the leukocyte reduction thing. Most countries have been leukocyte reducing the majority of their products you know, since right around that ballpark, maybe not quite as aggressively as, as the United Kingdom did, but uh, certainly in the last in the last ten years or so, the vast majority are are leukocyte reduced. So that may it may come into play. I don't know. So what was the conclusion of the study? Well, their basic thought was that. Um, you know, their basic thought was they made a statement, and they made the statement not specifically in the paper, but they they made it in an ABB teleconference that they gave. And I could summarize it this way: they said the donor that donor and not recipient factors are the primary drivers of TAGVHD, and that's a pretty strong statement. Um, I, I'm not sure I can go quite that far. And, and believe me, these are, these are amazingly brilliant authors that have far more credentials than, than I do and are, I'm sure are 20 times smarter than I am. But I, I'm not sure that the data definitely shows that. I mean, my first thought when I read this paper, and, and you and I had talked about this before, and I think we thought, thought the same thing, was, well, well, duh, of course they're seeing TAGVHD in, in <laughs> right. people without obvious risk because we already irradiate for the other ones that are at risk. Come on. How can this be revolutionary? Um, okay, I'm, I'm over-dramatizing a little bit, but <laughs> they argue very strongly that that does not explain all the discrepancy. They, they feel like, and they, they show some population data and some data in terms of the diagnoses of the patients that were transfused so that th- they believe, and, and they make the statement, that um, there's still overrepresentation of these uh, of these patients who we wouldn't think are at risk and and one of the things that they bring up that I find really very interesting is that the it, they reported from data from the UK from the from the shot data that they mm-hmm. showed that that about a thousand actually over a thousand patients in the UK who were at risk for TAGVHD got non irradiated products. Uh, so oopsies, in other words, uh, scenarios mm-hmm. where people that should have gotten irradiated products didn't get irradiated products. They looked at all thousand of those patients and mm-hmm. found no cases of TAGVHD whatsoever. Um, now, was it because they were getting older products or they didn't question. go into that depth? To my knowledge, they don't break that down. Um, okay. But, and, and what we certainly can say is that the products were all, ira- uh, were, sorry, were all Lucas. All reduced. Lucas. Reduced. So, you know, uh, who knows? I mean, there, that there may, I, again, I'm not, I'm not arguing with their conclusions. I just think that they, they make some pretty strong statements and I'm not sure I can quite go as far as they do, but I think there is more to think about. So basically, they're going to, with the idea of homozygous donor, mm-hmm. heterozygous recipient that, that's a, being the main. That's a bigger deal than what we had thought. That's that's kind of their, their bigger level. deal than irradiating for immunosuppressed patients. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean. So, do you think we need to stop irradiating for immunosuppressed patients? Yeah, I don't. I don't think anyone would go that far right now. Um, I, I I think that. Uh, that for the in, the clear cut indications that we've had in the past, I don't think that this data is is something that would support our uh, eliminating that right away. Then that UK experience that I told you about before, though, does mm-hmm. suggest that it may not be quite as important as we thought it was. But still, I don't think anyone would say, "Hey, stop irradiating for those those immunosuppressed patients." Okay, and in terms of. Um, directed donors, family members, those with similar HLA profiles, should we continue to irradiate or should we stop irradiating? Uh, th- again, I, I, that's really kind of the group that they're, um, I mean, the the reason why those folks get uh, TAGVHD is the reason they're pointing at is one of the biggest mm-hmm. things. Those HLA similar products definitely still need to be irradiated, no question about that, or treated in whatever way, to uh, whether that's pathogen reduction or irradiation. What about um, irradiate? So you know, some like we, as you mentioned, there are some hospitals that irradiate all products. Mm-hmm. There's others that oh, you know do it based on 
orders that come in from the uh, clinicians. Mm -hmm. Some have policies that they do all the babies, you know, under four months of age. Um, What about um, irradiating uh, fresh blood? Yeah, boy. You know, that's, that's a really interesting question. And I think that, I think that that question is the one that the, the Hemonk doc that wrote me that email was kind of frustrated Mm -hmm. about. And I think that that may be ultimately where we get, um, it's, you know, the data here when they're showing that there's no THGVHD outside of, outside of, you know, products stored 14 days or more, the converse obviously is that all of them did occur in products that that are less than 14 days. I I suspect that as we go forward and as we study this more, which I really think we need to do to continue to study this, we may eventually get there that that um, that products that are quote unquote fresh products should be irradiated as close to transfusion as possible. And I know some of the uh, my guess is I shouldn't say I know my guess is some of the the folks that are involved in that paper may be looking to do that. Um, I, again, I, I don't want to speak for them because I don't know that for sure. But that that may be something that practice does get changed as a result of that. But the other thing to think about is that if that's true, does that mean that if for for people that we don't really know are at total risk for THGVHD, like you know babies that haven't had an exchange transfusion or an intrauterine transfusion or a solid tumor patient or or a non Hodgkin's non Hodgkin's lymphoma patient where we don't have that inherent built-in uh, immune defect. Can those, if those people get blood that's older than 14 days, do we not have to irradiate those blood products? I don't know. Or do it's, we just give everybody older blood? <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, and in light of all Which the discussion goes against that's all, going on, yeah. We're on about I, fresh blood, I know. <laughs> exactly. There, it's, there's a lot to think about. I mean, the, but the good news is, Heidi, is that, that whatever we do, we're already dealing with a rare scenario. We're, de- we're not dealing with something that's occurring, you know, 14, 20, 2000 times a year. We're dealing with something that occurs very rarely. So whatever yeah. we do to me is just a tweak. And I, but I think we will tweak ultimately. And, you know, the authors did conclude that it was the one way HLA match that was mm-hmm. the most problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, would you, and I don't think we're there yet, in terms of just infrastructure to do it, but would you consider um, closer monitoring of one-way HLA match, you know, matching patients and donors? That's rough. And coming up with some sort of yeah. policy for that? Yeah, it, it's it, that's that's hard for me. I, I got to tell you the truth. I, I think that the, clearly the technology is not um, – the technology is not there – to routinely do HLA matching on donors and recipients. I mean, that's, I mean, we technically could do it, but it would be extraordinarily logistically difficult to say nothing of the expense. And I don't, I don't want to, you know me, I don't want to make it all about the expense, but it is an important consideration. No, of course it's important. You know, the alternative to that is to do what, uh, what some facilities have gone to, as you mentioned, and just do a blanket. Everything gets irradiated, Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I have, I have said before that I think that might be more aggressive than we need to be, but, you know, in light of the data that's here, I think that's something that, a that, a uh, a place that has the ability to do that, like a Cedar sinai for example, I can understand why they would, um, you know, again, we're talking about small numbers, tiny amount of risk, but if it's easy enough to do, if you have the, if you have the capability on site to do it, what does it hurt? Well, Probably not much, again, provided you're not keeping the product around for a long period of time after you irradiate it. Got it. Um, Because, again, irradiating, like you said, shortens the shelf life as well. Mm -hmm. So you have two ways to go. Irradiate from the beginning, you know, right when you get the product. So lose two weeks of your (laughs) shelf life. Or wait till day 14 and irradiate Mm -hmm. and then transfuse older blood routinely. But then if you're transfusing older blood, you may not even need to irradiate based on what the paper <laughs> no, says. The so thing. there's a lot to think there about. There's a lot to think about. And, and you know, the, the older the product gets before you irradiate it, the more, potass- more of a potassium issue you have right. as well. So I, I don't think that the irradiate after 14 days thing is going to fly. I, my guess is we're going to end up with some combination of irradiating stuff under 14 days and, uh, and somewhat more blanket irradiation for, for people that might be at risk. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's, it's going to be 
be interesting to see where all this leads us. But and and really, we're speculating, so so we probably should stop. But but that's the reality. We're, we're, it's not as simple an equation as we used to think, and that's the message that I want to get across. I think this paper. It, it puts up a lot of questions about the way we've always handled things. And it, I think it is important for every facility to think about what this means in terms of the patients that they serve. Well, Joe, this has been a great discussion. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your podcast and for giving us a very in-depth look at um, transfusion-associated GVHD and including some of the latest findings in literature and going over this fascinating paper that really, I think, may be a game changer. I appreciate it, and I want to thank our listeners for listening, and hopefully we'll reconnect sometime later with all uh, all of our listeners. Thanks, Heidi. Hey, everyone. It's Joe with just a couple of closing thoughts. Um, One thing I didn't cover in this talk very much, really hardly at all, was the mechanics of irradiation. And if you're interested in that, you can go to the uh, Blood Bank Guy video page. That's bbguy.org slash video. Um, and there you'll find a video that I made on why we radiate blood. It's it's not as much detail on the other stuff that I talked about today, but significant amounts of detail on the mechanics of, of irradiation, how it works, what the alternatives are, etc. So thank you for hanging out with me for this longer than normal podcast. I really appreciate you sticking with it. I hope you'll come back in a couple of weeks for the next edition of the podcast. And until then, as always, my wish for you is that you smile and that you have fun. And above all, never, ever stop learning. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you next time on the podcast. 